Good evening, everyone. Welcome to tonight's Writer's Workshop. Our topic tonight is Story Elements, Plot, and Prose. And you are probably very familiar with our instructor tonight. Please help me welcome back local mystery author, Molly McRae. Thank you for having me again. Um, we're going to cover plotting and then polishing our prose. Maybe spending a little more time on the plotting, but we'll, we'll see how it goes. Are you using the microphone? Oh, 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 sorry. It's, it's slipped. Is that, is that better? I'll project. Can you hear me now if I talk like this until she gets the microphone? I'll come out front. OK. Um, I like plotting uh, because it isn't an excuse. Hang on. As writers, it's, it's not an excuse, it's a reason. As writers, the world around us is our workspace. And if people tell you, what are you sitting there so quietly for? It's like, yeah, you don't have to worry about it because you're plotting. Because you can plot all, wherever you are. How many of you are working on a story now? OK, how many are working on a novel? In my experience, I've done both short stories and novels. Um, the process for plotting either one is pretty much the same once you get your, how's that? Oh, good, OK. Thank you. Thank you, Saul. Thank you for having me here tonight. <laughs> how many of you feel really stuck on how to come up with a plot? Um, we're going to try to fix that. Uh, it's, it, some people, I, I know an English professor. He's been teaching for decades. He still says he does not know how to plot. It's, it's, okay, first, let's get the plotting versus pantsing uh, argument out of the way. Have you heard of pantsing and plotting? OK. There are those who, when they write, say, oh, I couldn't possibly outline. I couldn't sit down and plot an outline first. I have to do it by the seat of my pants. I need to just sit down and write to get all that creativity down on the paper. And that's their method, and that works. They say if they plot, if they make an outline, it ruins the story for them. They don't all say this, but many of them do. It ruins the story, and by the time I'm done with my outline, it's so boring I couldn't possibly write. I think, after all these years, there is no difference between the two. Pantsers sit down and write a rough first draft. What are plotters who are writing an outline? or some kind of approximation of that. They're doing it from the seat of their pants. No one handed them those ideas. It's just a different format. So plotting, pantsing, whatever works for you, whatever combination of the two works for you, don't worry about it. That's, you know, don't get caught, caught up on those details. The outline is just a more economical first draft as far as I can see. OK, what isn't a plot? A plot isn't an incident or an anecdote or just a thing that happened. Um, E.M. Forster, the British novelist, author of A Room with a View and Howard's End and A Passage to India, said, a plot is the way story events, you know, events or incidents, or the way they are arranged sequentially to show cause and effect. He gave two examples of that. The first is, the king died, and then the queen died. Those are two events. They're sad. They're matter of fact. It's not, a, it's not a plot. It could be a story. It could be an event. So the second one is, the king died, and then the queen died of grief. 
You see what he did there? He, he added um, something that prompts a question. Even if those questions, there are several questions, even if those questions might seem obvious, you're like, why, why did the queen die of grief? What caused her grief? Did grief kill her? And if you write mysteries, the answer to that question might be no, not the grief. It wasn't the grief that killed her. So what do you think? What do you think killed her if it wasn't grief? If it wasn't grief? Or grief for the king. She felt uh, that she could now eat anything she wanted to, and she ate herself to death. Oh, there you go. OK, so there's action and reaction. Yeah, OK. Um, so yeah, going back to Forster's first example, the king died, then the queen died. There's no there there. It's just something. So I've had people come up to me and say, oh, let me tell you what I saw today, or let me tell you what happened. Wouldn't that make a great story after they tell me? Wouldn't that make a great novel? And I don't tell them no, but often no, because it is just an event. But of course, maybe they're thinking ahead of me. And they've already seen a story that comes out of it. And that's what you have to do. Um, Lawrence Block, who's written bunches and bunches of mysteries and thrillers, short stories, novels, started out writing in the 60s, writing lesbian erotica. <laughs> it made money. It kept him, it kept him afloat. Um, this is what he says about anecdotes and um, events and incidents. The writer, in possession of one fact or anecdote or notion or concept or whatever, is suddenly gifted with another apparently unrelated fact or anecdote or etc. Almost reflexively, he takes one in each hand and turns them this way and that, playing with the purposeful purposefulness of a child, trying to see if they'll fit together. And that's what you're doing when you're making a plot. You're taking bits and pieces, events, incidents, little conflicts, fitting them together, and that becomes your plot, the backbone of your story. Um, So what is plot? Yeah? yeah I'm, I'm sorry. I'm, this is new to me. I'm, I'm here because of Aging Week, Senior Aging Week. And okay. you put that down on the schedule, Writer's Workshop, they just called mm -hmm. it. And I'm feeling I'm in over my head, because I, I thought this would be like creative writing. So, but it sounds like all of you are wanting to write a novel. I think it's, it's, it's part of the short story short, program. Yeah. 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 Health therapy type. OK. So I'm feeling a little. Well, ask questions as we go along. But this could be helpful to you, too. Because in fact, fiction writing is often will, um, is, is helpful for nonfiction writers. If you look at something like The New Yorker, their long essays are often full of um, not fiction. It's all, it is all nonfiction. But they use elements of fiction storytelling techniques. And that's what a plot will do. It'll give you storytelling techniques. So if you want to write a memoir, you want to link bits of your life together, maybe. It might not work for you. But see, see and, and you're, you're welcome to leave if you want. But okay. I'll try a little bit. With okay. That. All right. Don't feel bad. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, a plot moves your story's action along through a series of events while lobbing obstacles, twists, reversals, danger at your character, culminating the story's, the story's conclusion. A plot gives your story structure. A plot puts the there there. Every plot has a beginning, a middle, and an end. There's also a climax, which might come before the end or right at the end. And that has its own buildup and resolution. 
the climax is where the story's tension peaks, maybe speaks, who knows, but peaks. What are the rules of plotting? There are no rules, just like there are no rules in anything else you write. But there are things that a good plot will have. A good plot has cause and effect, action and reaction. And here's an example of that. This, this is an old, originally anonymous poem, I guess. For want, I think it's an old, I think it's an anonymous plot. For want of a nail, the shoe was lost. For want of a shoe, the horse was lost. For want of a horse, the rider was lost. For want of a rider, the message was lost. For want of a message, the battle was lost. For want of a battle, the kingdom was lost all for the want of a horseshoe nail. So you've got cause and effect, and it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an action movie. What else does a good plot have? Conflict. Even if you're not writing a mystery or a thriller, if you're writing a literary short, there's bound to be some conflict. It should have, it should have some. Conflict doesn't have to be a fist fight. It can be people talking at cross purposes. Um, that happens with my husband and me. I'll ask him a question like, um, when is your doctor's appointment? And he'll say, the car goes in on Friday. And what he means then is that, so that means the car, the, the, my appointment must be on Thursday because there are two appointments. But it's like, ah, but so, you know, that can cause, unless you're used to that kind of conversation, that can cause a little bit of tension. Conflict can be tension. Um, it's aggravation. Conflict can be aggravation and frustration. It's people rubbing each other the wrong way. It's one person being irritated and another oblivious. It's the push and pull of human interactions. And it can also be fistfights, or it could be a conflagration. It can be a war, a world war. That can be a conflict, too. But there's conflict all throughout your day. Um, even, you know, it doesn't have to be another person that you're in conflict with. It could be your schedule. It could be um, the flat tire. You need to have action. And action can be more subtle than an action movie. Just like, and just like cause needs effect, action needs reaction. If you write a story where things are happening, and that's what stories are, things happening, if there is an action, try to have a reaction to that action. I read a story once where some characters were camping in the middle of the night. There were two tents of campers, two people in each tent. Person A woke up in the middle of the night and realized person B, who should be in the tent with her, wasn't there. She got up. She looked around, didn't see anything, but heard a gunshot. What would you do if you heard a gunshot in the middle of the night and someone was missing from your tent? Would you do something? Would you react? How, how would you feel? Something, wouldn't you? Well, this, this person didn't. She just went back to bed. I think she missed a bet there. But OK, so maybe that, of course, that is a reaction too, doing nothing. But it seemed out of character. It didn't work. So if you have the non-reaction reaction, have it fit or at least um, tell your reader something about that character. Like maybe she didn't really care about that person after all. That wasn't the case in this story, but. Um, if you show, oh, it was, um, sorry. a reaction can be subtle or unexpected, like the person going back to bed after a shot. That, that didn't really fit into the story, but that could be. And a character's unexpected reaction in a situation will show your reader something about that character that you don't have to say explicitly. 
Um, so a tip is that if you show your reader something like that, like a character not reacting to someone pulling a gun on them, don't then explain to the reader what they've just seen. Unless that's also part of the story where you're maybe in the head of one character and um, they notice that that person didn't react. But you have to be careful when you're plotting that you don't, or this is part of polishing actually, that you don't have something happen and then have the omniscient narrator explain what just happened. Um, it's unnecessary. It's not giving your readers credit for understanding. It's just, it's a, it's a little bit sloppy, unless it fits into the story that you've got someone constantly explaining what's going on and maybe giving it a twist as they go along. Consequences, you need consequences in your plot. High points and low points, you want to have, that, that creates some tension, you want things to be going up and down, actually sort of steadily building, not necessarily like that, although you could do that. Um, character growth. I'm not going to touch much on character tonight because this is plotting, but your characters, if you draw them well, if you know your characters and you know how they interact, plot points will flow from how they, the, the situations they get themselves into. Forward motion towards the end. Your plot does have to keep moving, keep dragging your reader towards the end of the story. Pulling them up that incline of tension and towards the, the, the climax which might be right at the end, or it might be, might be a scene or two before the end. And then you have the downward, and then you tie it all up with a satisfying ending, and everyone goes home happy. No, it doesn't have to be a happy ending. Um, the kinds of mysteries I write do have happy endings, if you can have a happy ending when someone's been killed. But um, there are plenty of stories that don't have a happy ending. There are plenty of stories that end, and you might feel satisfied but you might also then say, what just happened? And you might have to go back and read it again. There are movies like that. Um, everything er any, everywhere all at once is kind of like that, except that that's just because it's throwing so much stuff at you. At the end, you're just phew, blown away. Primer is a movie that you get through at the end, and you just, whoa, what happened? I have to watch that five more times. It's got a lot of jumping back and forth um, in time. OK. So with conflict, action, reactions, consequences, high points and low points, character growth, forward motion towards an end, there's an example of a book that does all of that perfectly. And it's a short story, although it's also a novel. Has everything you could ask for, including suspense, humor, a sense of morality, and a tall, dark, handsome stranger. It's the cat in the hat. This is an amazing story. It really, it has all those elements. It has the um, inciting incident where the two kids are sitting there and they have nothing to do. And then there comes a knock on the door. And it, just, it goes downhill or uphill from there with the tension created. Um, and they, or the fish is the, is the little conscience in the background saying, no, no, you, know, you can't, yeah, you can't do that. And it has a happy ending. Um, all right. A good place to start your plot is on the day that's different. And that's exactly what Seuss did. You know, the day that was different, their mother went out. These days, what mother would go out and leave those kids home alone like that? But, and, that, and what happens when you leave a kid home like that? Someone knocks on the door, a stranger knocks on the door, and they let the stranger in. Ah. Anyway, that's the day that was different with an inciting incident. 
That's a good place to start any story, rather than, well, I brushed my teeth again. Well, yeah, that, that's the day that's different, though. You know, if it's you brushed your teeth again, you ate your breakfast like usual, and then something happens. But you don't want to, you want to be careful. You don't bog it down too much in backstory. Okay. I like to ask myself these questions when I'm working out a plot. What if? Why did that happen? What next? And what now? So we, we kind of did that with the king died and then the queen died of grief. You know, like, what if? What if she died of something other than grief? She said, well, she ate herself to death. I could see that happening. So why did that happen? Why, why did that happen? You come up with that. And then, and then what next? Because you don't want that to be the end of your story. What next? What now? Then I like to add a certain amount of drat to the story. Oh, hang on. Yeah. Oh, hang on. OK. All right, so you can then start asking, what could possibly go wrong? Come up with your what if and what then. What could possibly go wrong with that? Well, many things could. Now, make it worse. This is what Donald Moss, who is an agent and editor, this is one of his favorite things. You take a situation, you get your people all uncomfortable in that situation, and then you make it a little bit worse. And then you make it a little bit worse. And then you make it even worse. He writes, he's, he's really into thrillers. And in fact, this is a domestic thriller. There's a, there's a genre of people talk about these days, domestic thrillers, where it's something that doesn't take place on the international level. It's in a little town. It's in a, um, it's in a house. It's in a family. This is a domestic thriller. Seuss was ahead of his time. Um, so these are all good ways to start building a plot. But you've got to have, of course, you've got to have the little incidents that go along with it. But you're writers. You, you, you've, you've got ideas bubbling up here, I'm sure. Um, so then, I like to add drat to my, to my stories. Danger, reversals, and twists. Again, the danger doesn't have to be mortal danger, although in a mystery, they do like having that. Even if it's a cozy, they like to have the, the amateur sleuth heroine who runs a yarn shop get in a little bit of mortal danger. And you can do that without making it bloody. You can do it without, well, you can make yourself pretty scared when you're writing it. I'm speaking from personal experience. What you're working towards is an end where a reader might say, cool, that was good. So. Let's try this as a group. Just a, a quick, we've got a bit of time. We'll just, we'll just try this quick. OK, so we'll, we'll start with a, an incident. Anyone want to offer an incident? Um, OK, let's say, let's say the king died, then the queen died of grief. OK, um, let's. Why did that happen? And we want to offer a, you don't ha we don't have to do this. <laughs> she loved him dearly, and uh, they had no children, and they had no other family around. They were very isolated, and she felt like uh, there was nothing left to live for. Wow, OK. Did you hear that? She was here. They were isolated. She, uh, she was very unhappy. They had no children. This is a strange king and queen. But that's OK. And then she, she died. Oh, so how yeah. did she die? Um, what's next? What's, what, well, what next? What, you know, let's say she didn't die. Let's say she didn't die of grief. He died. She didn't die of grief. What next? What does she do?
Okay. How, what could possibly go wrong with that? <laughs> you can, you can um, I'm sure you all get ideas all the time. You don't, have to, you don't have to go out and look for them usually. They just show up. You're reading the paper and you see something that's going to work. You overhear a conversation. So just collect these things and see how they fit together. It's kind of like Legos, although more like a cross uh, jigsaw puzzle maybe. Legos are a little more straightforward. Okay, what about subplots? Um, certainly in a novel, you need to have a subplot or two. And the short stories I've written have usually had a subplot. Um, that's where a secondary character can be present. A secondary character can be an obstacle or can present obstacles to the main character. You want your main character to constantly be thwarted in, in every scene, she should want something, figure out how she's going to get it, miss getting it for some reason, and then think of what she's going to do next to fix that. And then you have the next scene. That will help your story go forward, too. Um, secondary characters in your subplots can illuminate your protagonist's traits, flaws, backstory, and fears. So this wouldn't be a sidekick if you have a, a sleuth, but it'd be someone else that your character interacts with more than once. Not, not necessarily. Could be, could be the clerk in the grocery store. Could be someone who changes the tire. Could be the per she, per person she parties with when she goes to the city. Although that person might also turn into a major character. If you're writing a mystery, you have to have the villain show up early enough in the story so that it's fair game. And that person could appear to be a secondary character. If you do it right, you can lay out all the clues and have that person still somewhat in the background so someone doesn't know that that is the villain. And then as you're reaching the climax, all is revealed and all hell breaks loose. But your heroine saves the day, or your hero. What about flashbacks in a plot? You keep them short. And they need to have three elements in order to not disrupt your story flow. Um, a trigger, something that triggers the character to go into the flashback. The scene of the flashback. And then a now. That's all you have to do to bring the reader back to the present. You finish up your flashback with now, you know, because that was then. You do it more elegantly than that, but that kind of thing. There are, did this just turn off? Maybe I, oh, did, is that better? Okay. There are enough websites and videos and plotting methods online and in books that everyone should be able to find one they like. But be careful of that rabbit hole. If you read every book about plotting or watch every YouTube video, you won't have time to write, and that's what you need to be doing. There are some excellent books on plotting, though, and self-editing. Um, I think it went out again. I didn't even touch it, but it went out. Okay. Let me know if it goes out and I don't recognize it. Any questions on plotting and then we should move on to polishing because we've got to cover both. But do you have any plotting questions? Um, when I first started writing stories back in the late 80s, mid 80s,
I, there were no websites to look at, you know, to find information about plotting. There were some books. There was John Brain on writing a novel, I think. Um, but there wasn't this plethora of stuff out there. And in fact, if you'd ask me what a, if you'd ask me, whoop, if you'd ask me what a plot was, I don't know that I could have said what it was, and yet I was able to write stories. So I think if you read and read and read and read and absorb what you're reading, um, and think about what you're reading, deconstruct what you're reading, see why it works, see where those moments of tension come in, how they ramp up towards a climax, how then they come down to a, a conclusion. That will, that will give you an idea of how to create a plot. You could have another presenter up here after I'm gone telling you how to work on plots who might give you, it wouldn't be completely different information. There are basics about plots, but there are different ways of approaching. In the end, though, what you're looking for is a good story that captures your reader and drags them right through to the end. So now that you know how to make a plot and uh, you've been typing away or are finished with a story, I hope, I hope you're all thinking of entering stories in the contest here. That's, it's, a lot of, it's a lot of fun for the, the people who get to read them and, and for the ones who win and for anyone who wants to write because it's good practice. Um, but now we need to think about polishing up your prose. So here are some tips that, that I've used. Read your story aloud. I used to read my stories aloud in the attic to the cat. This was back in the mid 80s. Um, it, it lets you hear what's going on. It lets you hear awkward parts, words that you use too much. And I, and I, I certainly use some words way too much. I, I've, I've kept a list it's gotten quite long for things I should go back and look for. I wasn't aware of it to begin with, that I use the word little way too often, or bit, or some. Now, some, that's a very nonspecific word. And that's something you do need to look for, too, when you're polishing your prose. Use specifics rather than namby-pamby stuff like some people, or it's just, that's a throwaway word. If you're talking about a large amount, make it a better word than large. You just make it interesting without going over the top. You don't want to use too many adjectives, but did you know you can have your computer read your stuff aloud? I've not done that, but I've got friends who do that. They like that mechanical voice. I guess it's not really all that mechanical these days, but they like having that voice because it will sometimes mispronounce things and they can see where maybe the words were, are, should be fixed just because they, they are not normal, but you know, they, they, maybe they could make them easier. I don't know. Um, let someone else read it aloud to you. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's often my reaction too. <laughs> You have to be careful. There's a caveat with it. You have to be careful with who you ask to read it aloud. Some people can't read well aloud or manage to read everything aloud in the same humdrum voice, and you don't want to hear your stuff read like that because it'll really be depressing. <laughs> Trust me. Um, so listen, even if you're, you know, if you don't read it aloud, if you don't sit around reading it, you can read it aloud in your head. Um, and you can, you can listen to it that way, too. Um, if, you know, in, back to being specific in your word choice, 
in how you describe your character's senses and how your character feels um, you might not just describe a smell but you might pin that smell to a memory or to some other feeling some other sense um, make it more evocative if um, Rather than describing a color just by its name, describe it by something that is that color. I was trying to think of a good example of that, and the one I kept coming up with was awful. I mean, it was, I mean, it was icky, so. It's like she hadn't seen that shade of red since <laughs> she saw that blood. And it's just, yeah, I don't write like that, so I don't know why I came up with that. But that kind of thing, you know, you um, try to evoke some emotions from the emotions you're trying to evoke. Your story is going to be made up of scenes. A novel is made, a chapter in a novel is made up of scenes, although sometimes a chapter is a, a scene all on its own. But a way to look at your scenes to see if they're working as they should, see if they're pulling their weight. Oh. This is what I was trying to say, and I forgot I had a slide for it. Okay. In each, in your story, in each scene of your story, what does your character want? Why does she want it? What does she decide to do? She does it, but she meets an obstacle. And then the next scene starts over again. Now what does she want? I got this from Hank Philippi Ryan, who is an award-winning thriller writer and also a multiple Emmy-winning investigative journalist for a TV station in Boston. She's an amazing person. Never, never looks anything but absolutely perfect. Her hair, her skirt, her heels, and she's charming and she's so she, this is what she does for her scenes. She also, this is something that's good for any writer. She says, every, first thing in the morning, when she sits down to write, she says to herself, this is gonna be awesome. <laughs> I, don't, I don't do that, but it's, it's, a, it's a good way to approach your writing. Don't sit down and think, ugh, I've gotta write you know, 1,000 words or 750 words, just no. Do it, and it's going to be good, it's gonna be awesome might not be awesome, but that's okay. Okay. I didn't put enough notes on my notes. This is another, okay. Every segment, which could be a scene, should have a goal, a motivation, decision-making, action, and an obstacle. That's another way of saying what Hank said. I haven't, uh, I haven't looked at a literary short story to see to find all these, but I'm guessing they're there. They might just be hidden, but I'm guessing they are there. Um, here's something else. Saul Stein, who wrote, um, he worked in Hollywood. He also wrote novels. He also was a, I think he was an editor. Anyway, he, he wrote a book on writing, and he talked about when you're plotting, Put your characters in a crucible, uh, in a container that they can't get out of, that causes them to work against each other or at least come in contact in a way that they don't want. A classic example of the crucible is um, the old man in the sea. The shark, no, it isn't a shark, it's a, the fish, it's a marlin, isn't it? Yeah. And the old man are in a crucible. Neither one of them will give up. And that's where a lot of the tension comes from. Um, he, was, he said a, a crucible could be a family, you know, a family situation where you can't get out of it. The king and the queen, that poor queen, she finally got out of it because he died. I bet she killed him. There, there you go. What happened next? <laughs> There we go, okay. This is from a lawyer who writes th 
thrillers. This is what he likes to see in every scene that he writes, something unexpected in every scene. That keeps it lively. It keeps your reader on their toes, on edge, on the edge of their seat. It's a very high bar. It is, I know. And so you know, I th as, I, as I say that, I wonder, do I do that in every scene? I do try to think of doing that. That's where, yeah, it's a twist. It's a reversal. It's uh, an obstacle. The obstacle could be surprising. You know, it's not something, oh, I didn't see that coming. It's that kind of thing. Or no one expects the Spanish Inquisition, like Monty Python. This is what Nancy Picard, who writes mysteries, says. Conflict, action, senses, and emotional shift in each scene. What she was said, conflict, we covered that. Action, we covered that. Senses, uh, you know, hearing, seeing, tasting, all that. Emotional shift, though. What she means by that is your character will enter the scene feeling one way, and by the end of the scene, something should have happened so that that character feels a little bit different. It could be frustrating, you know, maybe they enter feeling optimistic that they're going to get what they want, and then they're thwarted, so they leave frustrated or um, determined or you know, something that could be sad. So an emotional shift, because you want to have that emotion in your, in your story, too. The one thing, you know, there, there are no rules. So this isn't a rule, but this is something that I live by. Something that I learned in high school from an English teacher who was an excellent English teacher. He told us when we were learning to write essays that revision is the key to success. What? Revision. So there, there are people who will say, oh, I couldn't believe it. I just sat down and I wrote this story and it's perfect. I think, probably not. Might be, that, that, that could happen. But chances are it needs to be revised. You need to look at it again. You need to read through it, see where you can polish it, even if it's just a word here, taking a word out there, taking out that explanation of a joke you put in that you didn't need to explain because it was perfectly obvious, um, getting rid of the little words that you don't need, the big words you don't need, anything. So have you heard people talk about voice? You need to find your voice. That's something you need to go back and revise for also. But you know, what is voice? That's a, that's a difficult thing, too. It, you, just, you don't hear a good definition of what voice is. Um, but they can tell you if you haven't found your voice or what they like about your voice, or that your voice sings. So that's interesting. But the only thing I've come up with is that when you enjoy what you're writing, that joy shines through, and that joy is your voice. And I don't know if that helps either. I think some people do find their voice, and it's not a voice that anyone wants to listen to. So I don't know. I, I don't know what you do about that. Is that where natural talent, if there is such a thing, is that where that comes in? I don't know. Is someone who hasn't found their voice tone deaf to a voice? I don't know. I, th I think everyone should be able to find their voice, though, and I think part of it is in the, the joy of your writing. I think it will come through as a, a genuine feeling. Andrew Golden, I think that was his name, who wrote uh, Memoir of a Geisha. He wrote that book, I think he revised it, did 18 drafts. 
and could not get it to work until he finally changed the point of view and he told it first person from the geisha's point of view. And at that point, the story took off. And as people said, he'd found his voice. Apparently, he was a, what, a 19th century geisha. And it worked. Um, so I think, I think you can find your voice. It, it might be a different voice for each, each book, too. I don't know. I write series. Um, so I have to try to keep the same voice within a series. And I haven't found that difficult. Um, it's because you live in their heads. Um, you just sort of channel them. OK, when it comes, what it all comes down to for the plotting or the polishing is reading. Read the things you like. Read the things you don't like if you want to, but reading, 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 and writing, and revising, and repeating, and write. Um, and the another big thing to remember besides revision is the key to success. Remember that if I can do it, you can do it. I'm just, I'm just a little person who writes and I've had luck. It does require some luck. It requires some talent, but it requires some luck. Although these days, with self-publishing, there are people who, there's a woman in town, um, Summer, somebody wrote, Summer Prescott writes mysteries, and is, she's self-published. I haven't met her, but she is extremely successful. Not everyone who self-publishes is, but it is an avenue. And there are plenty of people who are successful. And it's uh, used to be frowned upon. It's not at all anymore. It's uh, Although there, <laughs> there are self-published authors who now look down on people who are traditionally published by New York and call them trad, trad authors. I was like, ooh. What goes around comes around. <laughs> Any questions? I'm sorry it was so quiet. <laughs> I, uh, I find that choosing voice, choosing a uh, person, yeah. you know, is, is oh, whether a Whether you can do a third person or first yeah. person? OK, yeah. she has trouble choosing what, what point of view she wants to use. And, and I wrote a short story in one form, and then actually it was part of a, a class I was taking, and then switched it, mm -hmm. you know, and went through the whole story, which is tough because you've got to find every, oh yeah, you know, pronoun, every everything has got to be uh, changed. But at any rate, it was it was an interesting exercise, and I still don't know which version I like best. But anyway, yeah, <laughs> was, yeah, that, that's sometimes hard. It, it, yeah, I think so too. Yeah, glo global search and find for point of view isn't isn't really useful. It's a little bit useful, but you do still have to go back in and find all those. Well, and it's you know it depends on the type of story. Yeah. It depends on uh, you know I, I'm not sure, but what you have to just like you say, read it to yourself a few times, mm -hmm. decide which way is best. One of the things I do um, when I write is. I write, I, I set myself a goal of words per day because I have a deadline and so I, I know I have to meet it. Um, so I write my words for the day and then the next day I go back and read at least a portion of those words to get myself into the groove for what needs to go on but also as a way of revising. And if I do that well enough, you know, write, go back and read and write, go back and read and write, by the time I get done, it's pretty much done. Doesn't, I don't need to go back through it again. If I were doing a short story, I would go back through it again and again and again. But with a novel that's on deadline, and because it's going to have an editor, 
a developmental editor and a copy editor, I don't have to worry about it so much, which is nice. But I still worry about it. I'm very slow. Um, plus, I've got other things going on. But I've, my goal these days is 750 words a day. I, I've got friends who write several thousand a day. I have occasionally done several thousand, but almost never. I'm just, I'm, I'm slow. But it works, whatever works. You know, they, they get published, I get published. Yeah, it's okay. And if, if you've got, I've got a book due in January and then another book due in the middle of June, which is a longer book. But that's six and a half months. And the, the one for January I plan to have done by the mid, middle of December at the latest so that I do have a little bit of extra time because your brain gets tired. My brain gets tired. <laughs> I used to work here full time and write full time. There was one year while I was working full time that I finished three books. I will never do that again. <laughs> that, was, that was not pretty, but it worked. It worked, so that was okay. And it's what I wished for. <laughs> Any other questions? Was, was, well, was it helpful on the plotting? Did that help? Okay. I'm trying to think of, let's see, if there, I don't think there's anything else here. Oh, yeah, okay, just <laughs> on polishing. <laughs> That's from a New Yorker cartoon. Mm -hmm. uh, and you send it off to uh, the editor. Do they ever say, <laughs> you could have wanted that? <laughs> or do they ever say, um, you know, some kind, do they send it back to you and say, uh, you, we want to publish this, but, you, but we want it to, I don't know, yeah, well, a different person or something. I haven't had them ask for that. Um, for short stories, you send them out, and they're either accepted or rejected. They're not, you don't, they don't usually ask you to revise them. Right. They might for an anthology, I suppose. I don't know. Um, for novels, for, for instance, I, Penguin did not. They, they send out, you send, in the, you send in the manuscript. The editor reads it. They send you back what's called an edit letter. And it's going through the novel completely with suggestions, just suggestions. They never say you have to do this. I suppose they would. If, if they hated it, they'd send it back and say, oops, sorry. Um, yeah. What they say, you know, you might want to have a little more action here. Um, this, is, this part is not quite believable. Um, why don't you just take this whole character out? Oh, that happened to me once. <laughs> <laughs> I had to do a characterectomy and you know pull pull her out and 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 she was doing some she was pulling her weight but we got rid of her I just assigned that stuff to other people and had to rewrite it to make sure it was in the other character's mindset so that was interesting um, I'm always a little suspicious if the edit letter comes back with very little in it because you know, it, things can be improved, you know? I just, so that always, that makes me nervous. The, the book I turned in in June, the editor said, oh, this is wonderful. And I thought, and I'll send you, I'd send the edit, edit letter in, uh, you know, another couple weeks. And the edit letter came and it was nothing. It was just a few commas and things. And he left, it wasn't, it wasn't supposed to be the cop, because then it goes to a copy editor and it comes back with all the punctuation and stuff fixed. Um, you get it back several times. But now I'm nervous. I'm, I'm nervous because he said it was okay. And I just think, okay, it can't possibly be okay. It almost makes you wonder if they really read it or? He says he did. <laughs> he, I mean, he really, he did, because I, I, I questioned him. 
don't worry, don't worry. I know what I'm talking about. I just wrote a letter for someone else, and you should have seen how long it was. Okay, but <laughs> it's the first book in a new series, and I'm, I'm nervous. But, you know, I, I always have to have something to worry about. So that, that will be my thing to worry about now. But short stories and poetry, they generally just say no thanks. Yeah, and they, they might not tell you why at all. Yeah. Um, if you develop um, a relationship with an editor, they might tell you why. Mm -hmm. Hitchcock turned down one of my stories, and it was because um, one thing they, we know, the editor said, is that our readers will not like it if there's a dead dog in the story. And there, there, a dead dog. And there was a dead dog, but I didn't kill the dog. It just was a, a dead dog. And I thought, ugh. I mean, this is a murder mystery magazine. Well, they're not all murder mystery, but it's a mystery magazine. Uh, you could kill, what, uh, a grandmother? You could kill a, you know, <laughs> a family, but you can't kill a dog. Okay. So in the next story I send them that they took, there, there was a, no dead dog, a live dog, a good live dog who was rescued. <laughs> rescued from a terrible situation. <laughs> Thank you all for coming. Um, Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, a big thank you to Molly, as always, really helpful advice. Um, just two quick reminders. Um, the next time we meet will be October 18th. We're still continuing with story elements. It'll be cliffhangers and climax. Um, and we're actually going to be down in the studio on the 18th, which is Ooh. the new space. Ooh. The studio on the lower level. Oh, you mean? Yes. Wow. We're going to try out having a writer's workshop for the first time ever down there. Cool. So on the 18th, don't come here, come downstairs. But I will send a reminder to everyone who signs up. Um, and one more reminder, the story contest is still live. We are accepting submissions all the way through November 10th. Um, so for details about prizes, story guidelines, uh, you can visit champagne.org slash writers. Thank you for coming.